This is one of the cheapest 1440p 240Hz monitors on the market, and yet it's one of the better ones. Here is an in-depth look at the Philips Ebony F5500, otherwise known as the 32MC5500W. This bad boy is 32 inches diagonally, runs at 2560 by 1440 and up to 240 hertz, and rather miraculously, Philips claims this curved VA uh, panel has a 0.5 millisecond gray to gray response time. That's an incredibly bold statement, and of course, with the help of my newest open source response time tool model, the uh, Pro CS, we'll be putting that to the test. Philips also claims this can do 500 nits of peak brightness with a 4000 to 1 contrast ratio. Not bad. Physically, this follows the rest of Philips' Evnia line, save for the white colour scheme. This is a lighter than usual grey, but is certainly less visually appealing than the 8600 and 8900 that I've reviewed already. The back still has the sort of low poly shape, which I do like. The stand has all of the adjustment you would expect, including height, tilt, and swivel. Although one thing I would note is that the monitor is pretty heavy and the stand is pretty thin. So any side to side motion has the actual stand itself actively twisting. Now, it isn't a massive deal, especially since there is a VESA mount under the toolless mount anyway, but I thought it was worth mentioning. The foot is also pretty massive, spanning a large amount of desk space, and due to its very flat design, if your desk isn't perfectly level, the monitor will rock on the high point. Ask me how I know. Inputs wise, you get two HDMI 2.0 ports, which does mean you can uh, you can only do 140 ports over HDMI, and two DisplayPort 1.4 ports, which can do the full 240 hertz. Plus a four port USB 3 hub with the two yellow ports being for charging, and an audio out jack. One thing to note is the on-screen menu. It's controlled by a joystick style switch on the back, which is great, although weirdly it's kind of quite far behind the monitor and it's kind of awkward to reach. And even stranger is the delay between first pushing the switch, like now, and then it actually showing up. It's like five seconds. It's, it's weirdly a, a very long time. Although once you're actually in the menu, it's uh, still a bit on the slower side, but it's perfectly fine. Still, you have all of the options you would expect, including for overdrive mode or for overdrive options, and even smart MPRT sync, which is their backlight strobing mode that in this case can be enabled alongside adaptive sync. That's a pretty rare and kind of nice option to see, although it isn't a mode that I would recommend you actually use. I get a headache looking at that flickering and it isn't great for you, so personally, I'll be leaving that one off. As for the panel itself, my first impressions are that it looks rather nice. It's more than bright enough and pretty vibrant too. Content plays pretty well here, with the VA panel offering pretty deep blacks on the whole. It isn't as nice as an OLED, but for this price, uh, there isn't much competition there. The data from the Spider X2 backs me up here, with 491 nits at peak and 5220 to 1 contrast ratio. Although at lower brightness, uh, brightness levels, that's actually even higher, over 6000 to 1 at 50%, which is where I would expect most people to be actually using this thing at. Interestingly, uniformity was pretty off, with 17% less light down at the bottom right hand corner. That's basically 100 nits dimmer at full brightness down here, which isn't ideal. Happily, colour gamut coverage was excellent, with 95% coverage of the DCI-P3 spectrum, or 69% of Rec 2020. Nice. Color accuracy is top notch too, with a stunning Dell CE average of just 0.61, with a maximum only being 1.4, well under the threshold of 2 that we're generally looking for. That's wonderful. As for the response times, I should make it clear that that 0.5 millisecond figure is likely a mistake. Admittedly, it is a mistake that they've made both on their own website 
and on the Amazon listing for this monitor, but it's likely that that was a non-technical person filling in the same info at the same time, and it wasn't checked before publishing. Twice. This is the same mistake that I, let's say, helped rectify on uh, their other monitor brand AOC a year or two ago. Hopefully they'll rectify this one too and install some company-wide policies to check the marketing claims that they've been making since these monitors came out over a year ago now. Anyway, let's look at some actual data, starting with no overdrive. Now, being a VA panel, it's on the slower side, as always. It averages out to 7.4 milliseconds, or 135 hertz equivalent. That isn't too bad for a native panel performance, if this were a 144, 165 hertz monitor. Switching to the first overdrive mode, fast, that improves things to 6.8 milliseconds, or 146 hertz equivalent. The next mode up, faster, drops pretty significantly to 5.5 milliseconds on average, or 181 hertz. But that's still pretty far from the actual refresh rate. Let's see if the, the highest mode, fastest, can save things in... Oh, oh no, it can't. If you only look at the initial response time, then yeah, it's pretty fast. Just 2.4 milliseconds or 422 hertz equivalent. But that's ignoring the additional 3.4 milliseconds of horrendous overshoot time that's not included. For some context, here is what moving objects look like on this panel with no overdrive. It's a long, smeary mess, especially from darker shades. Now, here it is with the max overdrive on. You still get multiple frames of ghosting, but now those frames are inverse ghosting, which is arguably worse to look at. So it seems like the panel can't really keep up with the refresh rate, at least at 240 hertz. Really, this feels like a 165 hertz capable panel that has been severely overclocked. And now, that doesn't mean that the gaming experience isn't any good. In fact, in a game like Helldivers 2, it was a pretty phenomenal experience. The deep blacks make for really immersive viewing, and the frankly insanely tight 1000R curve that it has is, you know, has quite the immersive effect as well. It's still plenty smooth enough for that sort of game, although I did also test it in Rainbow Six Siege and found it decent but not quite fast enough to call that a great experience. I am happy to report that the input latency was spot on though, at around half the refresh rate, which is exactly what you want to see. The true selling point here really is the price tag. This is selling for right around £400, at least in the UK at the time of filming. I think Amazon has it at more like 430 but uh, still, that's like £200 cheaper than almost any other 32-inch 1440p high refresh rate display, and even more for 240Hz 32-inch panel. For that kind of money, I can easily eschew the slow response times, especially since it's perfectly fine for any genre right up to non-competitive FPS games. Sure, it isn't quite as good a 240Hz monitor as perhaps an IPS or especially an OLED, but for the price and what else you get, I can't argue anything other than this is a stunning deal right now. Of course, those are my thoughts, but I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. What do you think of the 32MC5500W? Is this a monitor you pick up yourself? Would you go for, you know, an IPS panel instead, or if you can afford one, an OLED, or something else entirely? Let me know in those comments. If you do want to check it out, I will leave a global Amazon affiliate link to it in the description. And if you want to see more videos like this one, you can hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. You can also pick up one of my open source response time tools at osrtt.com. I make them right here. Uh, I've designed them myself, wrote all the software myself, and they work pretty good. <laughs> um, Otherwise, that's kind of it. Uh, feel free to check out plenty of other videos on the end cards. I have a load more display reviews if you're interested. And yeah, otherwise, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this. We'll see you all in the next video.